My name is Jeff Farbman from the Wallace Center at Winrock International. Welcome to the National Good Food Network webinar, State of the Food Hub, a summary of the 2013 National Food Hub survey results. Food hubs are of such great interest to many who are interested in scaling up good food, and rightly so. At the center of the value chain, food hubs satisfy the needs of farmers as well as the needs of the buyers and end consumers. <clears throat> this is the first in-depth study of the US, uh, in the U.S. looking at uh, health and impacts of food hubs. And the Wall Center has been proud to partner with Michigan State University Center for Regional Food Systems under the National Good Food Network Food Hub Collaboration to do this study. So now let me ask Dr. John Fisk, director of the Wallace Center at Winrock International, to speak a bit about the Wallace Center. John Fisk has an extensive history as a national leader in sustainable and equitable food systems work. Prior to leading the Wallace Center, John served as board chairperson and later as director for programs and development at Michigan Food and Farming Systems. John has also provided food systems consulting to regional and national organizations. He is a published author of agricultural research and has written several chapters on sustainable food and farming systems. John holds a PhD in crop and soil sciences from Michigan State University. John? Hi, everybody. Great to be with you today. The Wallace Center at Winrock International has been a leading organization in the movement for more than 30 years for sustainable and equitable food systems. Today, the center supports entrepreneurs and communities as they build a new 21st century food system that's healthier for the people, the environment, and the economy. The center serves the growing community of civic and business and philanthropic organizations involved in building a new food system in the U.S. In particular, we're proud that we're focused on advancing regional, collaborative efforts around the country to move good food, food that's healthy, green, fair, and affordable, beyond direct marketing, into larger scale wholesale channels. I think today's webinar is a great example of focusing on food hubs that do this. Back to you, Jeff. Thanks, Sean. Let me just uh, speak a little bit about the National Good Food Network, or NGFN, which is an initiative of the Wallace Center. It is structured as a network of networks, ensuring efficient flow of information, and innovation from boots on the ground projects back to the national level and uh, from the national level back down to the grassroots level across the nation. The Wallace Center coordinates and supports the network. Our goals are to work with the growers to ensure that there is abundant supply of good food to meet the high consumer demand for the product, to collect and disseminate the best models, stories, methods, and outcomes, and to ensure that policymakers are informed about the wonderful successes our network and partners have had so that we can continue to increase support for regional healthy food. You can learn more about the great work of the National Good Food Network on our website, ngfn.org. One major piece of the NGFN's work is the NGFN Food Hub Collaboration. For the last couple of years, we have worked to support the growth and success of food hubs across the country with a four-pillar approach, networking, research, such as this study and the recently released Food Hub Benchmarking Study in collaboration with Farm Credit, technical assistance, and intensive work with nine study hubs and some regional food hub networks. We have a library of fantastic resources on food hubs. You can get there directly by typing foodhub.info into your browser. This is a collaboration with USDA Mark Ag Agricultural Marketing Service, MSU Center for Regional Food Systems, Farm Credit Council, and recent collaboration partners Wholesome Wave, National Farm to School Network, and School Food Focus, all bringing unique perspectives uh, supporting this linchpin piece of regional food systems. So let's get into the, the meat of the presentation. Let me introduce Rich Pirog who is Senior Associate Director at the Center for Regional Food Systems at Michigan State University. His work includes developing a statewide food hub network and providing oversight to new center work, work groups and communities of practice. From 1990 to 2011, he was associate director and program leader for marketing and food systems at the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture in Iowa. At the Leopold Center, Rich directed the Value Chain Partnerships Project, an our, our Iowa-based network of food and agricultural working groups that provides technical assistance to farmer-led food businesses. His research and collaborations on local foods, food networks, and communities of practice, food value chains, and eco-labels labels, has been published publicized and cited widely. His re recent writings include Economic Impact of Local Foods, Food Hubs, and Good Food Value Chains. Rich? Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, and good afternoon, everybody. Really glad to be here with you all. Um, okay, 
I think we should be having our, our slide move ahead. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm, uh, um, my role here is to just sort of frame the presentation and talk about why do the survey and uh, why the partnership. Uh, first of all, just wanted to give you uh, a little information about the Center for Regional Food Systems. Uh, the Center was formerly the CS Mott Group for Sustainable Food Systems at Michigan State University. The current center, which is uh, directed by uh, Dr. Mike Hamm, uh, our mission is uh, uniting the applied research, education, and outreach expertise of faculty and staff members at MSU to advance understanding and engagement of regional food systems. This is a big university, and there's folks across a number of colleges and institutions that are doing work, and we're trying to be able to facilitate more collaboration uh, and more cooperation uh, in both research, education, and outreach. We're also uh, the organizers of the center. We, as we look towards the future, we envision a thriving economy, equity, and sustainability for Michigan, the country, and the planet through food systems that are rooted in, as John Fisk described, good food, food that is healthy, green, fair, and affordable. And uh, that shared vision about good food is one of the reasons, one of many reasons, why we're uh, partnering uh, with, the, uh, with the Wallace Center. So again, we'll get started here. Uh, my uh, role, again, is to talk just uh, a bit about the, the uh, survey and the partnership. And I want to start with two quotes. Uh, I think most of you have heard these quotes before. Um, uh, they're both uh, two of my favorites. Learn from the past, live in the present, and plan for the future. And uh, I imagine uh, we're up well, uh, well over 250 people on this call right now. We probably have a uh, uh, a wide range of folks that have been involved in the local food movement for a long time, some folks that are new to local food systems and food hubs. And um, we've really come a long way in the local food movement. I'm one of those folks that have been involved in it for a number of years. When we think about how we've built on direct marketing efforts, and here we are after uh, food hubs really have only come into the vernacular in the last several years, uh, we, we're presenting a national survey study results about food hubs across the country. It's really amazing how much we've accomplished in the last number of years. And so, um, you know, a big part of the reason of why to do this study, again, learning from the past, there's lots of lessons we've learned in direct marketing. There's lots of lessons we've learned as we've tried to aggregate uh, local food across farms to be able to uh, distribute that food to larger volume buyers of all kinds of institutions. And so, really, we're marking this, this survey, and, the, and uh, Jeff talked about the benchmarking survey. We're really cutting new, uh, well, plowing new ground, metaphorically speaking, it's something we don't want to do from a soil conservation standpoint. But we're really, I think we're really coming to another, uh, another sort of dimension in the, in the work as we uh, continue to build on what we've learned. And so, we're really here, in part, to help learn from what we're doing here in the present around food systems to plan for that future. The other quote that I really like, and both of these folks are authors, one in the present day, one over 150 years ago, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And I think uh, uh, those of us that are new to the movement and those that have been involved for a long time, I think we all realize that we don't want to just take any road. We want to build and learn from each other, and we want to move forward in ways where we can take that knowledge um, and experience it in different ways and turn that knowledge into collective wisdom on how we can build good food value chains and food hubs that, again, can get uh, food to all kinds of markets, including underserved markets. So um, we want to talk about the, uh, why the survey. Uh, just a few important points to highlight here. Obviously, we've seen a growing number of food hubs in the U.S. since the term has come into the vernacular in the last uh, four to five years. Uh, as you'll hear, uh, we're able to, to uh, survey over 100, we're able to get completed responses from over 100 food hubs across the country. Um, there's been a lack of information on characteristics and performance. And for us to be able to move forward and plan ahead, we really need to know where we are at the present time and what those characteristics are. We also need re reliable information to inform investment in policy. 
you, you, uh, you can't go a week if you're on, say, uh, Google uh, search for food hubs and you're seeing another feasibility study in another community that says, hey, you know, we're recommending that this, old, this building be used for a food hub. We also need to have programs that uh, provide incentives, grant funds, uh, loan funds, and we really need to know what the characteristics of food hubs are and what role they can really play in delivering good food to a number of markets. We need baseline data uh, uh, and uh, time series data so that we can see the progress over, over, over a number of years. And this study, uh, again, there was one in 2011, a much smaller study, but this study really can provide sort of that, that baseline as we move forward to have those broad characteristics about food hubs. And also, it helps inform those networks, those learning communities that Wallace helps facilitate that uh, here in Michigan, we have our own uh, Michigan Food Hub Network. Food hubs learn best when they learn from each other. And they need to have touchstones. They need to have ways to be able to, to sort of tell their story and be able to describe how they and what they're doing relates to what's happening across the country. So, um, so that's some of the reasons why. As far as the partnership itself, uh, we've got the Center for Regional Food Systems, Wallace Center. Uh, Jeff has already mentioned uh, the key partners in the uh, NGF Food Hub collaboration. Uh, we certainly um, uh, can't underestimate USDA's role, leadership uh, role in this uh, throughout this whole process. And um, again, from someone that's been involved in the in the local food movement for a long time, this really is a true partnership that we've developed. I can't tell you how um, how we've been uh, how um, not a, how often we communicate but how well we are able to communicate to try to bring a quality product, a quality survey into, the, uh, um, into, the, um, into this world, into this work, and be able to try to work with all of you to try to interpret this and understand uh, 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 this research and where we're heading next. So um, again, uh, the Center for Regional Food Systems is just really glad to be part of this partnership. Um, we really got a, a great story to share with you here. Uh, as we uh, tell you a bit about the, uh, the survey results. And with that, I'm going to turn things back to uh, Jeff Farman. Thanks, Rich. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the um, prime researcher here, Michaela Fisher. Michaela is a graduate affiliate with the Michigan State University Center for Regional Food Systems. She is also a master's student with the D Department of Community Sustainability at Michigan State. Michaela moved to MSU after five years as an advocate focused on agricultural and environmental policy with the Pew Environment Group in Washington, DC. Michaela's current research is focused on food hubs and their role in developing a more diverse and equitable agri-food system. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in biology from Wichita State University in 2006. Michaela. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, as I said, I'm Michaela Fisher. I'm a graduate affiliate for the, with the Center for Regional Food Systems. And I uh, headed up some of the work on developing and implementing this survey and writing the results, but not without a lot of help. Before I get into the findings of the survey, I want to um, say a little bit more about the survey for those of you who didn't participate or had never heard about this work before. Um, as you probably surmised, we did do a national survey of food hubs, and we did it in conjunction with the uh, Wallace Center. And USDA assisted quite a bit in the development of the survey, and we really wanted to start developing some of this good baseline data and investigate the things like food hub financial viability, their economic impact, and emerging uh, market opportunities. And we conducted the survey between February and March of this year, and we were collecting data from food hubs on their 2012 calendar year operations. We surveyed food hubs using National Good Food Network's Food Hub Collaboration list of food hubs. At the time, in early 2013, there were 222 hubs on that list. We also used a uh, code fill out our survey. That being said, we did use the collaboration and USDA's working definition of a food hub, which you can see on the slide in a tablet. 
And in the end, we were able to get 125 food hubs to respond to the survey. And we were able to use 107 of those sets. Community effort, and we want to know how much we appreciate Uh, the time and effort that develop it. So just to get into the findings, um, we'll go over some of the characteristics of the survey respondents. I want to note that these are just the highlights from the survey, and that a full report of all the findings is available at both the Center for Regional Food Systems and the National Good Food Network's websites. And we'll provide links to both of those pages at the end of this presentation. I also want to just give everyone a heads up, this will be a very graph heavy and chart heavy presentation, and then I'll be moving fairly fast through the slides. So advanced apologies for that, and please know that these slides are posted on the National Good Food Network's website uh, if you want to spend some more time with them. All right, so on this slide you see a map of the location of the 107 food hubs whose response sets we were able to use. We were very pleased with the distribution as it reveals more food hubs in areas where we kind of knew there was more activity going on, such as up and down the east coast in the eastern seaboard, and less so in the Rocky, uh, Rocky Mountain areas in the south. Um, we also wanted to look to see if responding food hubs were located in metro or non-metro counties. And we define metro or metro, not metro or non-metro counties using USDA's 2013 Rural Urban Continuum Code data set. And from our responses, we had 75% of the food hubs located in metro counties, which are those represented in the shaded three rows at the top of this chart. We had another 16% that were located in counties adjacent to metro areas, which are represented by the red text in the non-shaded cells. Overall, this accounted for 91% of our respondents. And we wanted to look at location of food hubs in this way because we were interested to know if proximity to a highly populated center was important for a food hub's financial success. And what we ended up finding was that there was no statistically significant relationship between the type of county a food hub is located in and its reported reliance on grant funding. However, the proportion of food hubs that reported being highly dependent on grant funding was much higher for these nine food hubs that reported to be located in non-metro counties and not adjacent to a metro area. And this suggests that proximity to a highly populated area may be important still for the financial success of food hubs. And we'll discuss more about factors related to a food hub's reliance on grant funding later in this presentation. Beyond location, we also inquired about the operational structure that food hubs were using. And you can see from this slide, the majority of food hubs were either operating as nonprofits or for profits, with just a few operating as cooperatives and even less as public markets. We also asked the hubs how many years they had been in operation. And from this chart, you can see the food hubs responding to our survey were a relatively young group. However, we did have a few respondents that had been around for a very long time, and those respondents skewed out our averages. So as you can see from the average, median, and range data in the lower left hand of this slide, we had a median that was much lower than the average and a very large range. This slide shows a breakout of the type of products that responding food hubs sold, both by the percent of food hubs that carried them, which is displayed in the orange bars, and by the average percent of total gross sales that each product category held for the food hubs that carried them, which are represented by the navy bars. So the way to read this is that 93% of food hubs carry fresh produce and herbs. And for those hubs that did, fresh produce and herbs accounted for an average of 68% of their total gross sales. Interestingly, 22 of our 81 hubs that answered this question concentrated 95% or more of their sales on fresh produce and herbs. And a few others concentrated about this much on meat and poultry. But from the figure here, we can see that while many other foods carry products beyond fresh produce and meat and poultry, these two most popular categories, there were, the other product categories generally constituted a minimal amount of what the foods, food hubs overall sales were compared to poultry and produce, or produce and meat.
Next, we looked at the number of employees that Food Hubs had. And we had 82 Food Hubs respond to the question about the number of employees they had. And then some of those 82 Food Hubs had 787 full-time year-round workers. And you can see from this chart here, we have the average, median, and range for Food Hubs as well. Again, with a little bit of a skewed out average so that our median is smaller than our average. Um, and we found that 58 Food Hubs had at least one part-time employee and 33 hubs had at least one seasonal employee. Um, the full report has more descriptives regarding the food hubs utilization of part-time and seasonal employees as well as volunteer labor. So um, I recommend that you go check out the full report if you have um, an interest in those sorts of figures. We also found, and this may be unsurprising to many of you, that the number of year, years of food hub had been in operation was highly correlated with the number of full-time employees it had. And newer hubs are more likely to have fewer or no full-time employees than old, older ones. We're also interested in the skill set that food hub managers had, as effective management of a food hub stands to be important for its success. In the survey, we asked how many years of experience the food hub's most senior manager had in each of the areas listed in the table you see here. On average, food hubs reported that their senior managers had somewhere between one and five years of experience in all of the seven areas listed here. And that generally, they tended to have more experience in strategic planning and less in food processing and production. Next, I'm going to go into some findings from a portion of our survey that focused on questions about the producers and suppliers that food hubs were working with. I'd like to note that we were asking food hubs to answer these questions about their food producers and suppliers and not asking the producers themselves. So in some cases, these answers may reflect best estimates from the food hubs. Um, nevertheless, you can see that our average food hub worked with 80 different suppliers and the median food hub worked with 36 different suppliers. The large range of between just a food hub working with only five different suppliers all the way up to 2,000. We also asked the food hub to um, report any demographic information they knew about their uh, producers and suppliers. And on average, we had food hubs reporting that 29% of their producers were women, 21 were people of color, and 26% had been in operation for less than 10 years. For those of you who are familiar with these sorts of statistics on the national level, these are just slightly higher for each than the national statistics. We also asked the hubs to estimate the number of small and mid-sized producers that they worked with. And we defined small and mid-sized as, generally speaking, farms and ranches with gross annual sales less than half a million dollars. We use this definition because half a million dollars in sales is a breakpoint that's used in ag census data. From this pie chart, you can see that we found that 76% of food hubs indicated that all or most of their producers fit this small to mid-sized category. Not shown in the chart is another interesting finding, though, that 71% of these food hubs working with small and mid-sized producers indicated that the number of these producers they worked with had increased over the lifetime of the hub. We also asked about the value of the products purchased from small and mid-sized producers and compared that to the food hub's annual gross sales. On average, we found that 60% of the food hub's total gross sales came from small and mid-sized producers' products. And 80% of these food hubs also indicated that the proportion of sales from small and mid-sized producers' products had increased over the lifetime of the hub. Also pertaining to producers, food hubs were provided with a list of production certifications and practices and asked if they were required or preferred any of them or if they had no preference about their use. For brevity, I only included the top 11 practices in this graph. But the average amount of hubs that required a practice are represented by the orange bars, and the average amount that prefer them are represented by the navy bars. Finally, regarding producers, the hubs were provided with a list of options in the graph shown here and asked if all, most, some, few, or none of their producers had changed in these practices since working with their food hub. So we can read this graph as saying 51% of food hubs 
reported that all or most of their producers had diversified their product offerings since working with the Food Hub. Next, I'll go into some of the findings from the survey about Food Hub customers. As with the information about producers, these findings represent the Food Hub's providing information about their customers and not us asking questions of the customers themselves. On this slide is a graph that shows different Food Hub customer types and then shows the average amount of Food Hub that sold to that customer type. Also shown in the far right column is the average percent of total gross sales that these customer types filled for the Food Hub selling to them. There's a bigger, better chart in the report showing this information that wouldn't fit on this slide well, but I encourage you to check that out if you want to know more. So we can read this chart by saying that 58% of our responding food hubs indicated that they sold to restaurants, caterers, or bakeries. And that those restaurants, caterers, or bakeries accounted for an average of 33% of those food hub sales. You'll also see now that I have some percentages highlighted in orange text. I wanted to just highlight that these three customer types community-supported agriculture, the hub's own retail, and online stores all accounted for around half of the sales of food hubs that utilize them. This is much more than any of the other customer types. So we can say that food hubs that utilize these three outlets for their products seem to rely on them for a larger portion of their sales than do other food hubs that work with this type of customer. And now I'll get into some of the exciting findings revolving around Food Hub finances from the survey. Uh, we asked the hubs to give us uh, their total revenue for 2012, and as you can see, 104 hubs responded, and our average uh, revenue was a little over $3.2 million for 2012, with a lower medium closer to about uh, half a million dollars in a very large range. Um, Again, not surprising to some of you, revenue was significantly correlated with years in operation, with older hubs tending to have larger total revenues than younger hubs. We also used a measure called the business efficiency ratio to look at food hub revenues in proportion to their expenses. An efficiency ratio measures the hub's expenses as a proportion of their revenue. So operations with an efficiency ratio less than one have revenues that exceed their expenses, or in other words, are profitable, while operations with an efficiency ratio greater than one have expenses that exceed their revenues. On average, business efficiency ratios were 1.07 for all hubs, and the median was just at one. We had a very large range, again, from 0 0.04 to over six. And we have breakouts for the expenses, and other financial metrics in the full report, but I will go into a few of them here. So we wanted to look at these ratios by different types of hubs, so displayed here is the breakout by different operating structures. As you can see, in general, cooperatives have the lowest efficiency ratios and therefore brought in the most revenue in relation to their expenses. We also wanted to look at these ratios. Oops, sorry. Excuse me. We also wanted to look at these ratios by different ages of food hub. As you can see, in general, food hubs that have been in operation for more than 10 years had the lowest efficiency ratios, and therefore brought in the most revenue in relations to their expenses. Um, I also want to mention here that the National Good Food Network has undertaken a benchmarking study for food hubs recently and released some of their initial findings. And they looked at some of these same financial measures for food hubs as we did, but they were also able to dig deeper into some financial metrics than we were. So I encourage everybody who's interested in this sort of thing to check out that webinar from last month. So we were also interested in looking at profitability in another way. So we asked food hubs about their level of reliance on grant funding. And the three answer choices to the question of how reliant is your hub on grant funding from public and or private sources to carry out core uh, functions is shown here. And the breakout of these answers, as you can see, only 17% of food hubs said that they were highly dependent on grant funding. And the majority of food hubs, 51%, said that they were not at all dependent. Um, and this you know, spread was a little bit of a surprise to us 
given that you know 34% of our responding food hubs were nonprofits. And you know we were really interested in why some food hubs were more reliant on grants than others. So we did do some initial looking at a number of factors to see which had significantly, statistically significant relationships to the measure of reliance on grant funding. And operational structure was pretty unsurprisingly related, with nonprofits tending to be more reliant on grants. But we also fun, found that hubs with more producers tended to be less reliant on grants. Um, but I want to note that these relationships do not indicate causation. So food hubs don't necessarily rely on less grant funding because they have more producers, for example, but only that a relationship between the two variables was observable. We also found that hubs undertaking some activities beyond aggregation and distribution tended to have a higher reliance on grants. And this slide shows a list of those activities. There were also many activities that food hubs were undertaking that seemed to have no relationship to reliance on grants. And this included food processing and offering liability insurance to producers. And more information about these additional services and activities and how they relate to grant funding is available in the report. So moving on, I'm going to now show you some of the results from the survey question that we asked regarding challenges and barriers to growth that the food hubs were facing. First off, food hubs were given a list of potential operational challenges and asked to identify their greatest, second greatest, and third greatest operational challenges. Six challenges were identified by at least 10 hubs, and those challenges are the ones listed on this chart. So I want to show you just how we can dig in a little more about this more on this, and we can look at one of these challenges, specifically access to capital. Only slightly more than 20 hubs identified access to capital as a challenge, but these hubs more often than not ranked it as their largest challenge. Further analysis of these 20 hubs revealed that they had similar population characteristics to the rest of the survey respondents. They were mostly under five years old and brought in less than a million dollars in revenue in 2012. But unlike the larger group, these 20 hubs were mostly for-profit or cooperative in operational structure. And so you'll see some of this more in-depth analysis on challenges in the full report. Finally, we also looked at barriers to growth. 96% of responding food hubs indicated that demand for their hubs' products and services was growing. So we provided these hubs with a list of potential barriers to achieving that growth and asked them to check all that applied, and the results are shown in this chart. Increasing staff was the barrier that most food hubs noted, 41 hubs or 49% of our respondents. Of these, 19 hubs were able to estimate the amount of money that it would take to increase their staff to an appropriate level. And these hubs estimated costs ranging from $10,000 to $250,000, with an average of nearly $67,000. So I just have a few concluding thoughts about some of the findings we've gone over. Um, you know, the really big take-home point from this survey is that we did find that food hubs really can be financially viable businesses, um, no matter their operational structure or their age. We found, you know, food hubs of all types and sizes that were operating in a financially viable way. Um, and good news is that, like I said earlier, most, all of our, almost all of our food hubs believe that demand for their products and services is growing. But I also, you know, want to go over the not so rosy finding that, you know, challenges still exist for food hubs. Um, food hubs are facing barriers that are keeping them from meeting this demand. And those, again, the top two are managing growth and balancing supply and demand. And, you know, in trying to find answers to about, about food hubs and collect some good data, you know, we of course just come up with more questions. And, you know, some points of really where we think some more research is needed is on less successful food hubs. We tend to focus on the success stories and who's doing things right, and that's good. But there's also some good lessons learned for some food hubs that are struggling or may have gone under. 
Um, we also weren't able to look at uh, the dynamics of food hub partnerships with other organizations and how those work in being able to maybe offer services that food hubs who are operating more on a standalone basis um, can do. We just weren't able to look at that, but I think that's an area ripe for investigation. Um, again, as I said earlier, we weren't able to survey producers supplying food hubs directly. Um, and if that was able to happen, we would be able to get a better handle on the real impacts that food hubs are having on these producers. And finally, kind of an emerging topic is um, impact that management skills have on food hub success. There's some new movements going on looking at this, and I think um, we'll get some exciting findings on that as time goes on. Again, as I said before, the full report of our survey findings is available in two places at both the Michigan State Center for Regional Food Systems website at foodsystems.msu.edu and also at the NGF and Food Hub website, which is foodhub.info. And in that report, we're able to cover more topics that I didn't have time to go over today, including you know, a review of Food Hub values and mission statement analysis, um, some looking at their expenses, and also we were able to look at a smaller survey done in 2011 and do some kind of very initial longitudinal data analysis, which was really exciting. And again, here's my contact information. If you have any questions that we're not able to get to in this webinar, please feel free to contact me, and I'd be happy to try to answer any, any of those questions. Thank you very much. And there's a lot of questions, so let's see what we can do here. Uh, so the first question is from Michaela. It says, what type of funding has sustained food hubs? Taking uh, percentages of food products moved, grant funding, membership fees. There's a number of questions, Michaela, about uh, the role of grants um, and, and, and other things in there. So maybe give us a little bit more about what you found out about the role of grant funding. Um, what does it typically pay for? What doesn't it pay for? Uh, percentages, anything that you might be able to offer. Sure. Um, you know, it's a complicated question. What we did find is that there were a number of, you know, very new food hubs that either started almost he very heavily on grants or very heavily not on grants. Um, we saw a lot of food hubs that were started off of people's own capital, you know, owner's own credit um, or from operations of another business that they spurred off of. So it, I think it's really um, specific to the food hub. I think it is really telling that some of our for-profit and, and cooperative food hubs really listed that access to capital was an issue for them. And I think that's because maybe they are not, you know, seeing grant funding as something that can really help them get off the ground. Um, and so that, I think, is, is something we weren't able to dig too, too deep into that. Um, it might be worth noting, too, that uh, the benchmarking study that the collaboration did recently, the financial benchmarking study, there was a webinar about that two weeks ago where they were able, with a smaller group of food hubs, to dig a little deeper about on, into financial metrics. Um, and that would be a good place to look for people who are more interested in grant funding and how that kind of works along a food hub life cycle. Great, great. Uh, next question, um, uh, either Rich or Michaela. Uh, someone's asking what was meant by balancing supply and demand? Any insights as to what, what respondents were thinking there? Well, I think many food hubs take on the role of coordinating supply to customers. Um, you know, part of the challenge that many food hubs face, I think, is, you know, making sure that they get the products that customers want from the producers at you know regular intervals and, and kind of I think balancing supply and demand encapsulates that whole realm of activities you know not only making sure that there's enough but there's the right types of products for the food hubs customers is that helpful 
Yeah, I think so. Rich, any comment on that piece? Uh, I, I couldn't say it any better. Okay, sounds good. Um, uh, here's another question probably for all of us. Um, someone says, I wish you'd address the break-even point. I believe it's between 4 to 5 million with a 20% margin. At this level, the hub can hire professional and qualified staff and pay them. Right? So the question is around, you know, at what level uh, is there, it assumes there's a certain volume they need to get to to pay for fixed assets uh, in order to be break even and then continue. Anything from the survey that speaks to that, where that is, and if that's true? I think the thing that would speak to it most is the business efficiency ratio that we looked at, which looked at, you know, expenses in relation to the revenue that was bringing in. And what we really did see, we didn't look at it specifically on the amount of the volume of product that we're pushing through, but we did look at it in age. And 10 years of operation really seemed to be when food hubs, you know, very consistently were bringing in revenues that were beyond their expenses. And until then, it wasn't extremely high for most hubs, but expenses did tend to be a little more than revenue up until that point for food hubs. So it's a maturity um, aspect for as far as we can see with food hubs right now. Yeah, and I would add that I think it depends on the model as well. I mean, right. there's so many different um, types of, uh, of models in terms of what markets they're trying to serve. And many of them uh, have a direct marketing component as well as a wholesale component. And, they, um, and I think the ones that have that direct marketing component probably have less infrastructure and uh, uh, probably break even earlier. Uh, whereas if you're strictly wholesale, it may be later in the game in terms of uh, size and volumes. So um, next question, um, let me see here, uh, it says, are there food hubs that are connected well with one another? Also was data gathered about the area from which the product was traveling to the food hub? So it's kind of a question about uh, are food hubs cooperating with other food hubs? Do we see any of that? Do we, do we know anything from the survey? And then the other piece of it is um, the area from which product was traveling to the food hub, either distance or, or whatever other components. I'll speak to the second part of that question, the area which um, food hubs were working within, and I'll leave Rich to talk more about food hubs networking and talking with each other. Um, we did ask about local and regional aspects of food hubs in the uh, survey. I wasn't able to go over it um, in the presentation, but if you look, if you have a hard copy here, it's on page, um, it's on page 34 and it's figure 27. And we asked, um, you know, where the location of food hub producers and uh, customers were each. And we found that, you know, most food hubs were working, you know, within a pretty regional area. We had, you know, 53% of our food hubs said all their customers, or most of their customers, were coming from within a 50-mile radius. And um, we only asked about producers from using a little bit more blunt measure, the 400-mile radius, which is, was used in a lot of farm bill language in the past. Um, and we found that uh, quite you know, the majority of food hubs were bringing in, you know, all or most of their product from within this 400 mile radius. So they are staying within, you know, pretty localized regions for the most part. And on networks, John, I, I, I want to uh, leave the space for you to talk about the, um, the study hubs that, that, uh, that Wallace facilitates and the, the technical assistance network. But in, in, in general, I think there's a trend here for to, to learn from each other and have a lot of, of assistance from some of the typical um, organizations that might be able to provide support, whether they be, be nonprofit organizations within their state, extension, uh, other technical uh, assistance providers, very specific consultants. But I think over time, as that hub sort of moves from less dependency on grant funding, those relations, those business to business relationships become even more important and the, the hub has to spend more time in that competitive space 
where it gets its information as opposed to the pre-competitive space when it's still you know sort of doing at the same time it's planning you know it's maybe moving a little bit of product but it still hasn't completed a feasibility or, or marketing study so I think there's that sort of one foot has to be in front of the other but that foot that's in the back better be pretty stable otherwise the, the, the hub can you know can falter so I, and I think that's important and, and, and John again Wallace does such a good job of helping facilitate some of that technical assistance it's worth mentioning Right. So I think, you know, in the vein that hubs can learn from other hubs, we do quite a bit of that, and Rich does quite a bit of that in Michigan. Um, so I think that's, that's a good way to go. I'm wondering if, the, if the, um, the question is also asking about commerce, are food hubs connected through, through their, actual, um, their actual work on the ground? And so I don't think that the survey tells us anything about to the extent that they're cooperating or working with other food hubs, um, but I suspect they are. We do know that many food hubs, the majority of food hubs, actually sell to other distributors that may be larger or serving broader markets. And so uh, to the extent that they're in that supply chain, they're doing that. Um, I think over time, especially if more and more food hubs emerge, and with so many of them being new, I think there is going to be either you know, a, a cooperation of hubs in order and some specialization, perhaps, so that then they cooperate to get into markets. Um, or there may be a consolidation of some sorts if we get we get a lot of hubs in one area. So, but I'm not sure the survey tells us anything about all that. I, I would just add, uh, as you mentioned, John, anecdotally here in Michigan, because we have a learning community of existing food hubs, uh, and they meet together on a regular basis, we're starting to see some interest in moving product from certain areas that have, have unique products to other hubs. Yeah, and I think that makes sense. So you find those natural alliances. That's excellent. Okay. Let's see here. A um, couple of questions uh, about uh, food safety and about GAP certification. Um, there was a bit in the survey about um, um, uh, the extent to which they, uh, food hubs might require GAP certification and the extent to which um, farmers might have changed and, and acquired GAP certification. So we saw some of that. I think, Michaela, if I'm not mistaken, both of those were quite, one might say, quite low. Yes, they right. were quite low, and, and yeah. it'll be interesting to see, you know, with the new FISMA rules being implemented, how that might change over, you know, the coming years. Um, it was really interesting in some of the kind of open-ended pieces of the survey where we just asked food hubs to elaborate if they were interested. We got quite a few um, responses to the idea that, you know, they, they would require, that food hubs would require their producers to be GAP certified. You know, there was a lot of responses such as, you know, we don't need our producers to be certified because we know them and our relationships are close enough that it kind of, you know, overtakes the need for these certifications. But um, changing landscapes and food safety regulations may change that. And um, as we you know, potentially do this survey in years coming, it'll be, that'll be a good thing to keep an eye on. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of survey, there's a quick poll on your screen. Please uh, vote on that, and then we'll be able to show you the data right away. Uh, so I think exactly, we do quite a bit of, at the Wallace Center, quite a bit of work here uh, with hubs and others around food safety. Um, uh, you know, buyers, I think, have been saying for years, we're going to want it, we're going to want it. I think with FISMA coming down the pipe, uh, they finally are going to want it um, and going to require them, and especially with the growing interest in um, food service markets, especially schools, I think, um, we're going to see more of that. And so we're doing quite a bit of work to try to help food hubs prepare for that. Um, we're working to develop uh, what we call a group gap option. And so not every individual farm would have to be certified, but they'd have to be certifiable. And so through the food hub, um, working with growers to develop food safety protocols and standards uh, that give buyers the assurance uh, that they need in order to put it on the plates of their customers. So uh, we're working closely with USDA on that and um, hope to have that available in the coming time period. Okay, next question. Okay, I'm, I'm double dutying here, folks. I'm a little slower on the question uptake. Uh, 
Uh, here's a good one, and, and hopefully we can find some good answers for this. Uh, it says, can you elaborate on the range of costs that you observed for operations? Because the spread seems to be quite large. Can you offer some details and examples of NPOs and for profits at the bottom of the bottom and top? What was the median? And we're, you're asking about expenses? We are. We're talking about uh, costs that food hubs uh, have and how those spread out and, and anything we know about what they are and what, what percentages they might be and how they might relate to profits or, or lack of profits. Yeah, I'm looking for the chart in the report right now. It's figure 24 if you have uh, the report in front of you. We did ask food hubs about um, different kinds of expenses and to kind of delineate those as a person of their revenue for us. And what we really did find is that, you know, food and product purchases really were the brunt of most food hubs expenses. We had on average it, op it occupying 61% of um, their, their total revenue. Um, the other largest expense that food hubs were experiencing was salary and that, you know, occupied on average of 23% of their revenue. So everything else, you know, things like credit card and bank services, utilities, um, paying for consulting services, those things really paled in amounts um, in comparison with food and salaries. Um, and that was for food hubs across the board, no matter what the operational structure was. We didn't break that out um, in the survey findings by operational type, but it's something we could do and is probably is a really good idea to look into. Great, great. Uh, someone asked if there's a national network of assistance for food hubs like there is for niche meat processors. Well, in a, in a shameless plug for the National Good Food Network, uh, the National Good Food Network is the closest thing to that and with the National Food Hub Collaborative, um, I believe that it occupies that role. Uh, the webinars that we do regularly, the research and the partnerships that are done through the collaboration as well as the national conference that's coming up really do um, result in a national assistance network for food hubs. Uh, a question around which operational structure for food hubs was most successful? Co-ops, not-for-profits or for-profits, et cetera. What did we learn about that, Michaela? <laughs> well, it's a difficult question because it really does depend on how you measure success. Um, you know, we have, we looked at financial success by looking at the business efficiency ratio and, and in that we found that cooperatives were generally the most successful because their expenses were lower, the lowest in proportion to their revenue on average. But that being said, you know, a nonprofit food hub doesn't have the same goals for financial solvency as a cooperative or food prof for profit has and you know without really looking at each food hub and what its individual goals are and how it's achieving those beyond finances it's really hard to answer that question yeah I, I would agree I would agree um, next question did the survey look at impact the impact on farmers who sell the food hubs and I and I believe it did, and I just, I know you went over that, um, but I think it's worth reiterating if some folks had missed it. So impact on farmers who sell the food hubs. Yeah, we did look at it. Um, we, we looked at impact on, on farmers in two different ways. And again, just to reiterate, we were asking food hubs about the impact that they were having on their producers. So it was a little bit of a secondary look at this. But that being said, you know, we did look at, um, small and mid-sized farmers specifically and you know on average we found that food hubs were working with a pretty large amount of those and that they were growing in the number of producers of that size that they're working with both in number and you know the volume of sales that they were doing from them so that was encouraging we also looked at different um, pract producer practices and how those farmers were changing in them over the time that they were working with a food hub and we found, you know, that um, I think if I remember right, diversifying their products was a really big one that a lot of producers or a lot of food hubs said their producers had changed in since working with the food hubs. Okay, good. Thanks for reviewing that. Um, let's go a little bit uh, further into financial self-sufficiency. Someone asked what share of food hubs that we surveyed 
are now financially self-sustaining. I believe I believe that's in that in the survey. We got numbers on that. Yeah. Well, we we have the you know the reliance on grant numbers, and we had you know over half of our food hubs said they were not at all dependent on any grant funding, which means they're operating off of you know funding from their own operations and profits mm -hmm. from the food hub or from um, other activities or services that they offer. Um, and only 32% said they were somewhat, which means they're either you know only reliant on grants to you know perform certain operations that they're getting off of them, which is really exciting. We also looked at you know the business efficiency ratio, and you know the median the median amount of hubs, which means at least half of our hubs were at one, which means their revenues were you know equal to their expenses. So at least half of our hubs are at least breaking even that we surveyed. Great, thank you. Okay, looking in these. Uh, well, uh, was there anything in the in the survey about the facilities that food hubs operate, uh, either the size, uh, the square footage, uh, cooler space, floor space, anything we know about the the infrastructure piece? We did ask about infrastructure. I didn't um, have a chance to go over it in this present. asked um, if they used it, whether they owned, leased, or rented. Yeah, I mean, I think it is a it is a good question in terms of if you're a new a new food hub um, interested in laying this out, how do you determine the size of a facility, and how do you determine uh, when to add on, for example, or or and start with anticipating needs and supply? Um, I think the facilities thing, because it is such a an investment in a and a um, and an ongoing expense, uh, there needs to be some good thought. And it could be a, re a future research piece or a future piece to explore more in the survey. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, what, did, what do we know uh, from the survey uh, about, again, about creating food hubs in terms of choosing a, um, choosing a legal model, for example? Do we know anything about what, what that selection offers us, you know, whether we choose to be a co-op, an LLC, um, uh, a single entity, or even a, or even a publicly owned. Uh, does the survey tell us anything about what the implications are of choosing those various legal entities? You know, not not directly, but it. You know, there are lots of little clues that, because starting up is so capital intensive, um, that there and that for-profits and cooperatives have such issues with access to capital that there potentially is some worth looking into if it's easier for a hub to start as a nonprofit and rely on grants for a while or even just have a structure where they're reliant on grants for a while until you can hit that you know couple year mark in where you you know got a better handle on you know your the um, amount of employees you need, the amount of space you need, and you can really start um, generating a profit for which you can operate on. Um, again, we didn't ask questions specifically about that, but we kind of got this feeling that because of because of the need for access to capital, because of the you know 
amount of money that it starts to talk, that it takes to start a uh, food hub that, you know, that might be something that's worth some more investigation into. In mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, in terms of how the food hub relates with the farmer, in, um, does it typically purchase like a wholesaler? Does it uh, do it on consignment? What do we know about that? In terms of how they, what does that uh, commercial relationship look like? Yeah, um, that one's a little harder. We didn't ask specifically what kind of relationship a food hub had with its, you know, farmers or producers or suppliers, and especially we didn't ask about um, how they set prices because I suspect there's a fair amount of variability between food hubs and how they do that. We did ask one question when we were asking about services and activities about whether food hubs did brokering or not. And brokering is kind of a, an interesting way of working with farmers to figure out prices between the farmer, the food hub, and the customer. Um, and I'm looking for, I think it wasn't, it wasn't huge, but it wasn't insignificant either that there was a good handful of hubs out there that were doing brokering um, and, and kind of more than I expected. Which would mean that they don't actually take ownership of it. They just facilitate the pass through to the buyer. Said, yep. Yeah. Right. Okay. So. Okay. Um, you know, a, a number of the questions talk about um, uh, margins or how much does the food hub charge in terms of percentages? Did anything arise in terms of common percentage that the uh, the food hub would charge the grower in order to um, to survive, to, to fund its operations? Yeah, again, unfortunately, we didn't ask about pricing arrangements between food hubs and growers. And again, I think that's probably worth you know more investigation into the future. Um, mm -hmm because I expect there's a lot of variability and, and that, um, that it has, you know, different pricing structures have really different outcomes for different hubs. Yeah, and I know from, from and maybe Rich can comment as well, but I know from my uh, speaking around the country around this and answering questions, um, many food hubs are charging, you know, somewhere around 20%, which I think is, uh, uh, a better deal for many growers than they get from, say, a typical wholesaler or a conventional produce distributor. Um, and then it's not just the percentage as well; it's kind of the workability. It's the it's the quality of the relationship in terms of um, the give and the take, because there's a lot of give and the take because this is a, a a system based on the whims of nature, if you will. And so, so it's all in that in that vein. So I think it's not just the percentage, which I think are generally in the favor of the grower, from what I've seen but also the nature of the value chain relationship. And I, I would um, just, this is Rich. I would just add, John, that uh, I would have also estimated 18 to 20 percent based on what I've heard anecdotally. Right. And I've actually heard of some hubs that started out closer to 10 and then had to go up, you know, as things went on and they, they realized the expenses they had to pay. So I think over time these things shake out. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe just one more question here. Um, let me see where to go. Uh, data on who the customer is. Do you, do the food hubs deal with restaurants, institutional customers, or more mainline distributors? Um, you may have reviewed this too, but let's probably worth uh, reiterating what the customer portfolio looks like for hubs. Yeah, especially um, it's a little hard without the visuals to uh, remember that. But we did uh, ask questions about that. And, you know, the most popular types of customers that food hubs were working with were um, what we call restaurants, bakers, and caterers. Um, and the second most popular customer was corner store, or not corner, excuse me, small and independent grocery stores. Um, that being said, we had several food hubs that, like you said, John, had their own kind of retail arm, direct sales arm, and food hubs that really did sell in that sort of way and also uh, participated in CSAs, um, those types of customers really took up the majority of those food hub sales. So 
hubs that were working on direct sales tended to focus mostly on those, whereas even though a lot of food hubs worked with restaurants um, and small grocery stores, they were all those types of customers um, were part of a diverse, more diverse portfolio of customer types than some of the direct sales were. All right, I think that's helpful. Uh, okay, I, I, I'm talking to you. Last question, and then we'll get it back to Jeff. Uh, it says distribution bottlenecks and knowledge about getting goods from farm to market are described as perhaps the biggest obstacle to growing local. Are there any implications we can draw about whether food hubs uh, as a vital and essential to this growth. So distribution bottlenecks and knowledge about getting goods from farm to market. If I could just address that a little bit, I mean certainly um, you know many small growers they spend uh, extensive amount of time growing of course and then they'll find farmers markets. So the direct marketing piece of this I think is is easily enough done for them in many ways that they can handle that. But when it comes to uh, larger markets the time that I think it takes to understand pricing and buyer requirements, um, let alone um, the cooling facilities and then arranging distribution and all that, I think is, a, is probably very overwhelming for many small and even some mid-sized growers. And so uh, what we have found through research and surveys and, and um, case studies is that the, the food hub really does play that, fill that critical gap. And, and it's, not just, it's not just the time and the energy and the knowledge, it's, it's bringing together sufficient quantities in a consistent way that the quality is there, that the quantity is there, that the timeliness of delivery. And so um, these core functions that are attributed to food hubs really are uh, filling a solid gap in, in the marketplace. So much so that, again, as I mentioned, they're, they're playing that role even for the traditional distributors, adding value to this traditional supply chain. Any comment on, on all that, uh, Michaela? No, I think you said it well. All right. See, I was just fishing for that compliment. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Back to you, Jeff. Thank you for those great questions. Well, yeah, and uh, thank you to Rich and to John and especially to Michaela, who's done just fabulous work on this survey and its analysis. And thank you all for sticking through uh, these technical difficulties. I'm... Uh, I'm in the middle of an open Wi-Fi spot, so I, I hope you can hear me. Um, we have some really solid data showing uh, that, on the whole, full sub food hubs are successful triple bottom line businesses and seem to be on a rapid growth curve. So thank you all for these excellent questions that really honed in on uh, some of the finer points. Uh, the webinar uh, pieces of this webinar have been recorded. Uh, we will we will try to um, piece together what we have and post that, uh, and then um, if uh, Rich and Michaela are willing, uh, we will try to um, add, sort of splice in all, all the rest of the data that was missing, and we'll try to get the slides up. So um, give, give us a little bit of time to, to work that all uh, all out. Um, but you can find all of our previous webinars on ngfn.org slash webinars. Um, they're, they are organized by topic, uh, so go ahead and uh, dig into whatever interests you. Uh, we offer the NGFN webinars on the third Thursday of each month at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, 12.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific. Uh, Sign-up links are also on that ngfn.org slash webinars. In October, we're collaborating with the National Farm School Farm to School Network uh, on National Farm to School Month to present how food hubs are assisting in moving healthy local foods into schools. So really drilling down there. There are some schools where food service can buy directly from farms, but most uh, require the aggregation and distribution logistics that a food hub uh, can offer to make a program really possible. So join us in October for some of those success stories, including the fabulous Gourmet Gorilla in Chicago. In November, we'll look at some top-notch ways that trainers have solved the problem of teaching farmers the necessary business and financial skills to plan and run their operations successfully. One featured panelist will speak on an amazing curriculum designed especially for women farmers, and we will present an overview of our searchable collection of curated tools and curricul curricula available to anyone. Uh, and for the holiday season, we'll look at how some innovative food banks have been able to leverage their significant infra infrastructure and buying power to get local and regional good food to all people. So you can let us know in the post-webinar survey if you'd like to be automatically registered for any of all of our next webinars. Foodhub.info is a food hub hub of information, uh, research, case studies, a map of many of the food hubs across the country. Um, 
we are working with our nine uh, study hubs we mentioned. Uh, they are documented there. Um, there are links to TA providers with experience in aggregation and distribution. And moreover, feel free to contact us, uh, contact at ngfn.org if you're looking for a TA provider with a particular skill set. Um, the NGFN Food Hub collaboration is building a community of practice that John mentioned of Food Hub managers and staff and supporters. Uh, we have a newsletter about every other month, uh, technical assistance and networking opportunities and more. Uh, in the post webinar survey, you can indicate if you'd like more information about this community of practice. Foodshedguide.org is our site for producers wanting to adapt to the changing food business landscape. We have instructive test, text and case studies with an emphasis on how to have a viable business in a food value chain. Learn about, for instance, factors to consider when deciding on a legal status. You can find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, on our website, ngfn.org. The Wallace Center is also on Facebook. Come like us. Search for Wallace Center at Winrock International. Again, if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage, or just let us know in that post-webinar survey. We'll, we'll sign you right up. Contact us at any time. That email address is contact at ngfn.org. The NGFN would like to thank you for your time today. And once again, let me encourage you to fill out that survey. Uh, it should open in your web browser in just a moment. Thank you so much, and this concludes the webinar.